Hello everyone, thanks for joining. Today I would like to talk about a topic that is both um, fundamentally shaping our future, but also very dear to my heart. I would like to talk about artificial intelligence. However, I'm not here to talk about doomsday scenarios or ethical dilemmas. Both are crucial to the bait, yes. But today I would like to use your time to convince you that AI makes us humans more creative, more insightful, and I even dare to say it makes us humans more human. Now before I jump into this argumentation, let's warm up our minds and our brains a bit, and therefore I brought a couple of visuals. On these visuals, I'm gonna show you two objects, and I want you to think about these objects and ask yourself which one uses more AI, whatever that means. So let's start. Here, I have a car. It's not an autonomous driving car, we're gonna get there. It's a normal car and a plane. So what do you think uses more AI? The regular car or the plane? I think this one is pretty easy. We all know that during the flight, the pilots are in control when they start and when they land. And between those two actions, most of the time, it's the plane flying. It's the AI, it's the software, it's the machine itself. And with the car, well, we have a driver. So for this one, let's just say the plane uses a bit more AI, okay? Now, now I have autonomous driving car. I will not reveal the brand. And yes, both of those pictures were drawn by AI. Now we have a plane and autonomous driving car. It's getting a bit more tricky here. So which of those two objectives uses more AI? I would like to say it's actually the car because it's a bit more difficult to navigate for the AI through urban environments and traffic. You have other pedestrians, you have other cars, you have motorbikes and so forth. I wouldn't say an autonomous driving car is more sophisticated than a plane, but it takes more factors for the AI to actually calculate to get you from A to B. So for the sake of continuity, let's just go for the car here. Now, this is interesting. What about Autonomous driving car versus a smartphone. Which of the objects uses more AI? It's actually quite easy now because the car, even though I just established is very sophisticated in driving, it only does one thing. It brings you from A to B, that's it. But a phone, and you all know about this, does way more. You have so many applications on your phone, so the phone is more diverse. It may not be as sophisticated, but you can do way more things with your phone. And I bet you all of your applications that you use have AI involved. Now this is the last one, and this is actually a trick question. So who's using more AI, the phone or the person using the phone? It's really easy. It is the human that uses the phone because we use the technology. The technology is not using us. And I even would like to say that the person standing right in front of you wouldn't exist without AI. And I don't mean in a philosophical, existential way. I mean by hard facts. How did I come here? I took a grab. And it was an algorithm who chose the closest driver. How did I come to the country? I flew in a plane. And we just talked about it. The plane uses software that drives, uh, that flies the machine autonomously. And how did I get my clothes? Of course, the clothes were uh, shown to me in my social media based on the algorithm that knows me interested. And you know, I kind of went for it and I bought it with my e-wallet. Everything is AI. Now, why do I mention this? I mention this because you guys are already using AI every day. This is old news to you. But it wasn't four years ago. Four years ago, when I started working professionally on artificial intelligence, so I switched from academia to the think tank sector. My colleagues and I in Berlin, we were discussing internationally that AI probably is gonna be everywhere very soon. And I think if we look now, it is everywhere. But it's not a utopian, cyberpunkish, futuristic city with you know, flying cars, augmented glasses, and a robotic assistant. No, it's more subtle. It is more subtle because we, turned, uh, we reached a turning point in AI. I think AI is no longer about just crunching numbers really fast or, I don't know, sorting data really efficient. With advancement in natural language processing and deep learning, we reached a new level of artificial intelligence. We can now create applications that generate human language. What does it mean? Well, there's an example, I'm pretty sure all of you in the room at least heard about it. It's ChatGPT. 
What is ChatGPT? It is a language-based application you can interact with by typing in real um, language in real time and then a response. But it's really up to your imagination how you want to use ChatGPT, how it should solve your problem. It can give you a narrative structure if you want to start writing a novel. It can even give you the foundation of your first music song or it can give you hints how to actually write chords to make music. It can give you a first draft of your next op-ed. It can do so many things. And it's all possible because we as society started to digitalize human information. We started to digitalize human intellectual property. We started to digitalize human intellectual products. And we did it so that the machine can be more like us. Or is it because we humans want to be more like us humans? Because we want to be more human. So what do I mean by this? I think when we approach the topic of how we use AI, we do it from a wrong angle. We always say, oh, I teach this machine, now it can talk, and I teach this machine, and now it can drive. And yes, indeed, AI liberates us from repetitive tasks. And it allows us to open up new avenues of thought-thinking processes. Almost like in co-creativity with a machine, we can merge human intuition with machine-powered analysis. And this is how I use, personally, AI. I don't do it so it replaces my work and I can lean back in my office and just be lazy. No, I don't. I do it to improve my skill set, to learn something from other people who are already there. And this is another example. Actuellement, je suis en train d'apprendre le français avec ChatGPT. Et ce n'est pas seulement possible parce que ChatGPT peut parler français. C'est possible parce que j'ai appris comment apprendre le français or the long à l'école, et maintenant, j'applique. Si, I need to learn this for free. J'applique, uh, c'est la manière créative pour apprendre le français par moi-même. Now, this trick almost worked, but it didn't. Why? Because I used ChatGPT to produce a language and learn for myself. But... I don't, uh, I wasn't able to have this here and speak it because we taught the machine. I was able, almost, to do it because we are now capable of capturing the entirety of the French language and have me being able to tap into this bubble of knowledge with uh, interactive technology, with a digital technology. Now, I could now cite many studies of how individuals report how AI liberates them, gives them a different ownership of their product, make them feel more innovative. I will not. I'm going to be your evidence today. So let's talk about the big elephant I already put in the room, ChatGPT. I used it for French and English. But did I use ChatGPT to write my TED talk here today? Well, of course I did. And I have no problem admitting, there's no shame in admitting that you use a tool to achieve your goal. Let me ask you this. When you write an important email or letter to your CEO, to your director, to your secretary general, do you turn off the autocorrect in Microsoft Word or your email program? I certainly don't. I probably shouldn't, and I won't. Now let me ask you a second question. Where's the difference between clicking, right-clicking on a word that is underlined with red, because you have a misspelling, and clicking on an icon that copy and paste well-written text into your email. I think there is no difference, at least not in behavior. It's the same click. But in effect, there's a huge difference. Because this one little thing makes something wrong right, and that's it. No more further outcome. But this part here makes something good perfect. And this is how you should think about AI. It's no longer bound to one specific task. It is bound to your imagination, to how you approach this new technology with your creativity. Let me give you an example. Um, when I talk to friends and colleagues about how I use ChatGPT or other AI, it always boils down to one little principle, Pareto principle. Maybe you heard of it. Pareto, in short, says that 20% of consequences come from 20% chance. 
80% of consequences come from 20% of causes. So translated into work terms, this means 80% of your task can be done by using only 20% of your energy. That's the good news. Well, on the flip side, it means to actually finalize your project, those last 20%, you need 80% of your energy. Finalizing a task takes a lot of time, energy, and resources. This is the reason why we have so much trouble with deadlines. But this is how I use my AI for my Pareto. When I write a political analysis, I don't start with the in-depth concept note, you know, where I have to pinpoint every word and every sentence and I have to double check that I didn't write it before, no. I write down bullet points of the arguments that are important, the structure that I want, maybe the word count, and my core messages. And then I have my AI, my AI come up with a draft. And there is where my Pareto kicks in. I go into the text, I look, do I like the structure? Maybe this part needs to be a bit more objective. Maybe this part is not academic enough. This part here is not my wording. Sometimes I take previous text of mine, having analyzed by AI, and then use the same characteristic for my new text. And suddenly, I switch from this person, right, who puzzles together all the pieces of a picture, because this is how I used to write, to become the creative director of my own text. And that's basically it. So I still have 80%, but they make a lot more fun, trust me. Now, they are reasonable rejections to this kind of method. They're reasonable arguments, and I hear them. They say, well, Jason, you put in the prompt and you put in the uh, request, but in the end, it's really the machine that writes the text, no? And I hear it. But I would like to counter this rejection with a personal experience of mine. A couple of weeks ago, I was in Vietnam visiting a manufacturer of electronic vehicles. I saw a lot of heavy machinery, a lot of robotic arms, a very sophisticated and digitalized production line. But you know what I also saw? I saw human, I saw people working together, working with the robots, and I bet you, you will not find a single person in that factory who ends their shift and say, well, the car was kind of made by a machine. Will not happen. They're going to say it was human built because they look at the product, how it was assembled, the entire process. The car was idea before from a human brain. It was put into a design by a designer and then an engineer took it and put it into the production line and in the end you have the product and the product was put into the market by a salesperson. And for all of these steps, you need AI to be successful, don't get me wrong, but you also need the human to put all these steps together in a process. So to conclude, I think the art of using a digital technology is no different from the art of using a tool to build a car or to build a house. In fact, we are using AI to making those tools even better and more effective. And this is how we should look at AI. AI improves the way we interact with each other. We talk to each other, we communicate to each other. And in the end, AI improves the way we build society together. So in case you follow my argumentation, let's dispel this myth of having AI making us more robotic. If anything, I think AI reveals the complexity and beauty of the human mind. And by leveraging AI to a creative tool, we are not losing humanity. We are evolving it. Thank you very much for listening.